So let's continue. Um, I uh, like to focus on the two islands that are uh, not just close to my heart, they're also very popular with tourists and uh, they have the two large national parks. And Lanzarote being one of the eastern islands, it's got a population of 150,000 people and it's got a population density of about 180 cubic kilometers. So by uh, central European standards, it's a low population density. By Swedish standards, it's pretty high. And um, here we have lava landscapes, we have beautiful beaches, and we have a wine culture that goes back several hundred of years. And it's got uh, a grape, the Malvasia grape, that is grown there that's particularly attractive. It's not grown in many places in Europe any longer. So if you're a wine connoisseur, then uh, Lanzarote is one of the places to go. So here are some impressions. Uh, there's also a big salina. I'll talk about this in a minute. And the center of the island, like on Fuerteventura, is rather desert-like. And then there was a recent eruption, or historical eruption, and I mentioned that as well, which is the center theme of the national park. And here's just a few impressions from the coastal areas, beautiful beaches and uh, wild Atlantic coast. So uh, this is very attractive, one of the key attraction points in uh, Lanzarote. And it's got cliffs as well, some of these spectacular cliffs like the Fumara cliff in the north of the island. And uh, there in the lower left-hand side, you see beaches and cliffs together, making this spectacular backdrop for water sports. Now there is some uh, young volcanoes and you see the volcanic features all over the island. It's like pockmarks and uh, many of these volcanoes are not active anymore. And you see that they're partly overgrown uh, with uh, vegetation. So they're not dangerous in this sense. And if there was an eruption uh, coming, this would warn, uh, there would be uh, signals many months ahead usually there would be little earthquakes and steam and, and gas would rise and temperature would rise. So you can actually work with these volcanic structures because uh, there's very little chance of them ever, ever becoming active again. So people actually work with them. They make uh, all sorts of uh, structures out of them. I'll show you some examples a little later. One of the uh, geologically interesting phenomena is this volcano here, El Golfo volcano. It grew right at the coast and it's got um, uh, deposits that are typical for magma interacting with water, which was then later on followed by magma not interacting with water. And you see the boundary between these two types of deposits in the central top image there. The orangey rocks, they are kind of the um, ashy particles that interacted with the water during the eruption. And the upper ones, the brown and black ones, that's the typical magmatic behavior. So one key feature there is that the climate is very desert-like, but um, the local people have learned to use this to their advantage. The volcanic particles have loads of little bubbles, and uh, you can use that to capture the moisture. It's uh, like in the Sahara Desert, there's dew in the morning. And um, if you use these volcanic particles and put them out on the fields, you manage to capture the moisture that condenses in the mornings or overnight, and that will allow plants to be grown. And if you then use some shelter, because the wind can be very strong, then uh, um, you can actually grow all sorts of crops there. This goes back to the 1730 eruption. Um, people realized that if you, uh, it was the eruption initially doing it, but people realized quickly if um, the, the, the fields have a thin cover of volcanic ash and uh, particles, then the crops grow better. If there's a thick cover, they die, of course, but with a thin cover, they grow a lot better. And this is a way of cultivating areas that are otherwise barren or dry. And some people think this could even be an idea to uh, partly um, activate the Sahara Desert as um, uh, an agricultural ground, but this will require a little bit more study and a little bit more effort. But in the Canary Islands, this worked really well. And you can actually uh, fertilize large areas there. And here you see there's a cactus garden and there is a wine growth. And uh, it's, um, it's surprisingly successful. And this idea is uh, certainly used all over the Canary Islands. And it's quite excessively used. So this mulching technique, uh, as it's called, is something that uh, 
could be exported even more widely than the Canary Islands and has been partly exported to many other places. And uh, it led to doubling of the population of Lanzarote after the 1730 eruption. Uh, until 1780, the population had doubled because it was just suddenly able to grow a lot more crops and a lot more cereal and also wine. And the wine uh, growing was so famous that at the Vienna Congress in 1814, I think, um, it was actually wine from Lanzarote that was on the, uh, on the menu. And uh, entire valleys on uh, Lanzarote are now filled with these kind of Lageria uh, phenomena, um, the, the little shelters that they kind of produce for the, for the, uh, the, the vines. And uh, there they grow. Uh, this very successfully. And uh, this is something that is uh, uh, still very attractive to wine connoisseurs. And um, you can go to one of the bodegas, the, the vineyards there, and you can have wine tasting and um, that kind of thing. So here we have interaction of the volcanic landscape, the volcanic origin with the uh, agricultural products. And this is very widely exploited for tourism, of course. Now, having said this, there is a downside. Here's the downside. Because it is very attractive to put these volcanic particles onto the fields, there is also a lot of quarries where they have been taken from. And some of them are not very nice to look at because they look like, uh, well, chopped off volcanoes to geologists. This is like, um, yeah, how to say, this is like um, injured kind of um, uh, people after an accident. Uh, for a geologist, these volcanoes don't look healthy. They are not happy. This is not natural erosion. A geologist can tell that these have been dug out and um, this is the price you pay. And um, here's more of these examples. So in the lower um, left-hand side, you see that entire areas have been cut out of mountains there. And in the uh, top right, you see there's a volcanic crater that's mined inside. And it's actually a cement factory that's uh, partly kind of uh, supplied by this material there. So here, the human interaction takes a toll as well. Uh, we have to realize that. Um, the nice thing is it's, in, it, it's inside a volcanic crater. It's not particularly visible. Um, so tourists don't strictly see it, but um, uh, these things are there. And here's another one. This is a landfill site, again, inside a volcanic crater. Uh, so it's hidden from direct view. Tourists will not strictly see it, but you also see one of the walls has been quarried for these particles. And um, this is uh, where um, the local authorities are doing some of the, if you will, some of the not so attractive work. But it has to be done as well. Wherever there's humans, we have um, uh, to take care of these aspects as well. Now, I mentioned the Salina earlier. This is one of the oldest Salinas in the Canary Islands, and it's still going strong. And uh, it's got a visitor center, so you can go there. It doesn't have a Michelin or star restaurant, unfortunately. Otherwise, I would have tried it, I'm sure. And um, here, we can see salt production at the various stages of it. And uh, it produces uh, sea salt, obviously. And uh, that fills quite a niche. And uh, it's a very traditional way of now, other things that are very attractive on um, uh, Lanzarote is uh, lava tunnels and caves. And um, there is some uh, adventure sport opportunities. You can actually do cave climbing and uh, that kind of thing. And um, there is uh, guided tours as well. And uh, they go all the way up to very refined um, walking tours in some of these um, lava tunnels. There is one uh, little animal that's known that only lives in these caves there. It's a little crab that's uh, pigment free because usually it's dark in these tunnels and there's a little picture of it, uh, but it's very rare and its habitat is shrinking due to human uh, action, unfortunately, but um, it's still there and it's still um, being found. Some of these lava tunnels were exploited already by the original um, Guanche population and later also by the Spanish settlers because there was a lot of, initially, a lot of pirate attacks from uh, North Africa and people were hiding inside these lava tunnels. And later on in the 60s and 70s, many of them were built in. So here you have a restaurant inside a lava tunnel. You can see the skylight in the top right and that's the opening. And there you have a dance floor even, and um, 
uh, it, it's very nice. I never had a meal there, but I, I picture it to be very attractive. Um, there was an artist, Cesar Manrique, I'll talk more about him in a minute. Uh, he was very influential on Lanzarote, and he even built a concert area in one of the lava tunnels. So here, some of the spectacular cultural events are happening uh, inside lava tunnels. And um, here is uh, Cesar Manrique, and he um, was um, a painter, uh, an architect, and a sculptor, and uh, he was really influential. And uh, he left uh, a, a huge imprint on the island. So some people go there just to see his architecture and, uh, or his sculptures. And of course, um, this is something that enhances the tourism greatly. So here's a few more impressions. Here's one of uh, Cesar Manrique's buildings integrated into the lava field. And uh, of course, this is not real, but here he created a window which looks like that the lava is coming into the house. Now, um, he, he just put the lava there. It, it just looks like it. Of course, this is not real. Uh, but uh, the impression is just mind boggling, I find. So I had a look at this and uh, I enjoyed that greatly. Uh, just the idea of lava coming through the window was somehow inspirational. He created some very nice, attractive um, pools as well in lava settings. And he uses the lava tubes uh, here with uh, some openings that go into cave-like structures that uh, are underneath the surface there. He also um, uh, developed the concept of uh, viewing points, miradors, um, and here there's a little restaurant in the north of the island, and um, you have beautiful views, usually high up, and there you can have coffee or so while enjoying the views. So this is also something that goes back to Cesar Manrique, and um, his influence has been quite strong on Lanzarote. So I would like to talk a little bit about Timan Faya now. This was the big eruption in 1730 to 1736. It led to a lot of changes on the island. About a quarter of the island was suddenly covered with lava after the eruption. And there is a painting in the top left that was commissioned at the time. Um, the Spanish authorities sent several people from Madrid to study the eruption. The island was partly evacuated, and here you see some little pockmarked vents and lava fields that go back to this eruption. Here is uh, the area that was covered by the lava, and uh, the different pulses of the eruption are marked in different colors. We don't need the details, but uh, it was a large chunk of the island, about a quarter, that was suddenly under lava and ash cover. And this forced people to rethink, and this is actually where the use of volcanic particles in agriculture derived from. So here is just one of these uh, vents from the 1730 eruption. And if you go into this vent, if you climb inside, you'll actually see something spectacular. And that is, there is some rocks from the mantle that the volcano has brought up and people have learned to use this to make jewelry from. Here we have uh, these foreign fragments or xenolith as we call them. And uh, they contain olivine crystals. That's the green material, which was already treasured by the Romans and Egyptians. And uh, you can buy jewelry from that. And the local people are very good in using this. And of course, uh, they would uh, sell you the jewelry with the context of um, that it contains volcanic energy. There's a little flyer there in the top. Um, whether it really does this, I don't know. But uh, it's certainly very nice to look at. And, um, if you believe in the impact or the influence of these uh, minerals, then this is a calming mineral. So it, it kind of helps you to calm down. At the same time, it increases your energy. So you, you get focused from it, apparently. So the um, uh, National Park, it's, um, it's uh, younger than the Tayden National Park. It was established in 1974. And um, it comprises a large area of the 1730 to 36 eruption at the Timon Fire National Park. It's got this little uh, logo here, the devil, which was actually designed by Cesar Manrique. And I'm going to show you some lava features here now. So um, it's a bit like a moon landscape. And actually, some of the astronaut training from ESA, the European Space Agency, is done in these areas. Unfortunately, and this is one of the biggest criticism the National Park has received over the last few years, 
you cannot freely walk around there. You can go to a visitor center there, and there at the visitor center, they do them little shows, like they pour some water on some hot rocks, and then you get an artificial kind of geezer, or, or, and, um, like here in the top left, or you can do a little uh, camel tour or so, but you're not allowed to walk around freely. There's a bus tour as well that drives through there, but uh, this has actually been one of the key criticisms. And um, there has been several studies now, and I asked Lotte to send you one of these articles after our session today. Uh, tourists want to be free to move, and uh, this has actually led to a decline in visitor numbers for the Timan Fire uh, National Park over the last few years. So here you see it was rising for quite some time in um, uh, between 95 and about 2010, but since then the visitor numbers have been dropping. And uh, this is rather sad. I think some people argue it's over-regulated, if you will. So the visitor center is very attractive. You can have a meal there that's uh, serving chicken that's uh, grilled on uh, volcanic heat and things like that. And some other place they put straw into a hot hole where hot steam comes up and the straw will in, uh, kind of, you know, catch fire very quickly. Uh, but these are gimmicks um, in a way, and uh, it doesn't, um, it wears off very quickly. So this is one of the key issues. Um, and um, this has fallen a little out of fashion, this very regulated concept. So I'd like to bring you to Tenerife now. And originally I wanted to have a little break here, but I've talked a little too much. So we will not have another break now, but I uh, will take you to Tenerife. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that now. Now, Tenerife is uh, rather large. It's uh, the largest of the islands, and it's also the most densely populated. And uh, the population is 917,000, and it's got a population density of 444. So Tenerife is uh, characterized by these three arms and by a central highland, which has a big caldera. Caldera is usually a collapsed area, either vertically or laterally. Caldera comes from the Spanish word for pot, Sort of, it's, it's a big depression, if you will. And inside that, we have the double volcano Pico, Teide and Pico Viejo. It's got a beautiful kind of um, capital city, Santa Cruz, which is in the north, east of the island. And um, this hosts uh, many nice museums and places like that. And um, here is a satellite image of the central part of Tenerife. And there you see this collapsed area, the caldera. And um, then in the very center, there is um, the volcano Picotede with over 3,700 meters in altitude. And it's got a little beautiful crater on top. And there has been mining inside the crater for sulfur. But nowadays, we don't mine sulfur on volcanoes anymore. It's a byproduct from um, petroleum production, actually. And uh, therefore, the crater was spared since the First World War from mining. So here is um, Picotade sticking up above the clouds. So you get an idea why it was a useful navigation landmark for sailors all through the centuries. And here uh, on a non-cloudy day, you see that uh, it's got this beautiful little peak on top, which is going back to an eruption probably from medieval times. And then it's got these black lavas, the lavas negras coming down. And then it's got some light colored rocks in its periphery and we'll mention those a little later. Teide is hugely influential culturally as well as uh, economically, and uh, maybe no big surprise, the logo um, uh, beer uh, brand is called, uh, or has Teide in the, in, in the logo, so it's called uh, Dorada, but uh, you see Teide Volcano, Father Teide as it's locally known, in the logo of the beer brand, and uh, the neighboring island has a brewery as well, and um, um, the people on Tenerife say that their beer is a lot better because it comes from active Teide volcanic water. So here we have Teide, and Teide sits in one of these landslide scars, but this landslide is quite old. It's, it's several hundred thousand years old. There is no indication that there will be any major landslide in the near future. And there's also no serious indication that Teide will erupt very soon. There has been some earthquakes occasionally, but the last eruption on Tenerife was um, in 1909. It was not on Teide, it was on the Rift Zone, like all the other eruptions that are historically known. 
So here is an impression of the rift zone viewed from Tadis summit looking towards the northeast. And um, here is now the next image is a Google Earth image. It's exaggerated vertically, but here you see that uh, the ridge continues for tens of kilometers away from the central part of the island. And it's got a belt or a, um, um, a corona, as they call it, a crown of forest. And it's marked uh, in, in slightly darker green here. It's a beautiful forest area, which is also used recreationally, in, in, in particularly by the local people. When it gets too hot in summer near the coast, they go up into the forest and they have large picnic sites there. Now, the rocks are fascinating to geologists. Um, the uh, rocks in these areas, in these rift zones, are sheet intrusions. And this is something that um, geologists love to study because it tells us how magma is rising through a volcano. And here's one of my former PhD students, Audrey, looking at one of them in more detail. But um, I don't want to go into too much detail here because this is something geologists love, but not, uh, not so many other people, I guess. Uh, other types of intrusions are these sombreros, as they are called. They look like hats from uh, a buffer from the side. And uh, these are effectively magma intrusions into the surrounding where then you have erosion and then they look like hats uh, because the rock is very solid and it doesn't erode so easily. But uh, these are, of course, all cold. So there is not a lot of worry about them these days. The southern part of the island is also very famous for its light colored rocks. This is different to the standard basaltic dark rocks. And these have usually formed, or these light colored rocks, they usually hint at explosive volcanism. Now, these are more than 150,000 years old, so there is no worry about them right now. But uh, geologists get quite excited about them because these would uh, hint at large explosions like uh, we would have had um, at um, Vesuvius, for example, the Plinian type of eruption with large eruption columns. And uh, the imagination that geologists bring to this, that will make it very vivid for them. And uh, there you have even some lunar landscapes due to erosion. And uh, this is something geologists enjoy greatly. Now, I talked a little bit about volcanic caves and lava tunnels. And uh, one of the longest one in Europe is on Tenerife. And it's part of the national park as well. And here we have a uh, little kind of um, um, stalactites made of lava. When lava flows through these tunnels, it can actually melt the roof and then the roof is dripping down. And this is what we see in the right-hand side image there. And uh, you can visit them. And most of them are very accessible. Some of them are protected. You need to take certain precautions. But um, uh, some of them host particular animal species that are protected. And I'll show an example later. But what actually happens there is, these are subterranean lava flowing um, features. And uh, the right hand is from Hawaii. So there you see how these things really uh, happen in reality and how they form. On Tenerife, we only have old ones. The youngest, I think, is about 20,000 years old. So there's very little worry that there will be new lava filling them up while you're in there. So we can actually look at them and uh, enjoy them as a nature experience. As I said, there are some species of animals. Um, and uh, there is one particular um, cave that hosts a spider. And this spider is known from other places on Tenerife. The lower part is the um, outside spider, if you will. And it's got a, a kind of pattern to it. But the spider that lives in the cave is gone completely black. It lost its kind of um, pattern uh, simply because there's no light in the cave usually. And therefore, there was no point in signaling this pattern. And um, it's um, uh, quite full of these spiders, actually. I mean, uh, I'm not a big fan of spiders. So when I was in that cave, I mean, I felt a bit uncomfortable. Uh, but uh, you have to wear protection for your hair so that you don't leave any organic remnants behind. And then hopefully, these spiders will not be harmed. Some of the lava tunnels go submarine. And if you're a diver, you can actually go there and explore this as well. So this is very exciting. If the lava tunnels get filled by lava and the lava solidifies, you get these awkward features like stone roses. And this is also a protected site uh, in the national park. This is a former lava tunnel that was filled with lava and then solidified. So here, the lava tunnel was hosting more eruptions. And uh, this 
uh, created this spectacular stone rose, as it's called locally. The Tayden National Park is um, um, uh, rather large, and it um, hosts the red or pinkish area in the top right-hand corner of um, um, the slide here. And it uh, comprises the Las Canadas Caldera, the big collapse area, and the young volcano of Tayden. And um, it is actually one of the magnificent natural um, um, nature sites, and it's the most popular national park in all of Spain. It has more than four million visitors a year, and as you see in the diagram here, the visitors are rising. It's actually record numbers. And the beauty is, and I'll show you some examples, you are relatively free in the national park. And this, I think, is the secret of success here. So here you have the Las Canadas Caldera, which is this big collapse structure where a chunk of the island likely broke out or collapsed uh, into the magma reservoir underneath. And then you have the new volcano, Tate volcano, growing there in the center of it with all its lava structures. And uh, it's rich in geosites, very uh, spectacular volcanic features. Geologists really get excited about this. Many geology field trips uh, go there from all over Europe. Uh, it's one of the attractive things. Um, bringing students there is extremely popular. So this is something I will talk a little bit about now for the remaining part of my lecture session. So here, this is, of course, uh, very well mapped, so geologically understood. All the different events are characterized, but uh, very few of them are actually historical. Most of them are a little older and uh, well dated, so we have a good idea of how they form. And um, here in the top right-hand corner, you see the different eruptive events and the new Tate volcano growing with a bright red marking the Tate end. The Las Canadas Caldera, now here viewed from top of Tate, is a beautiful collapse structure that is now being partly filled up with uh, eruptions from Tate and from its periphery. And uh, this provides for beautiful kind of hiking. And you can just about see a hiking trail in this uh, light colored rock in the middle of this image. This is Montaña Blanca, the White Mountain as it's called. And you're free to go up there. There is no kind of restrictions. You're not supposed to stroll much from the path, but uh, once, as long as you're on the path, um, um, you're absolutely kind of uh, welcome to enjoy the landscape here. So here's some impressions of the Las Canadas um, uh, caldera, and uh, there's scientific controversy of how exactly it formed, making it very exciting for geologists, but um, it looks spectacular. And um, here the big controversy scientifically is, is it a lateral collapse or is it a vertical collapse of uh, um, the roof of a magma chamber or um, the side of the volcano collapsing into the sea? Well, we don't really know, to be honest. I personally like to think it's both. It started off as vertical collapses and then at the end, a chunk on the side broke out. That's my personal theory. So therefore, I don't fully understand much of this controversy. I think both parties are right. But um, this makes it exciting, as I said, for geologists. And uh, there's some spines standing out in the lower right. You see these uh, spines. So they're quite tall, actually. The rock is Del Garcia. And they host some of the most spectacular and most photographed geological features on the island. For example, this one here, the tree of rock. And uh, the tree of rock is the most photographed feature a geological feature on the island. And it's got a history in itself. It's, got, uh, it's made up of many layers. And uh, most of the surrounding material is eroded. And sooner or later, this, this will fall over. It's not going to last forever, we must accept. And uh, here we have um, a little interpretation sketch of the geological history that gave rise to it. So many layers must have accumulated. And then there is also two sheet intrusions gone through. And they are actually the reason for why the erosion pattern is so strange. The sheet intrusions are more resistant to weathering, and therefore it's more bulbous in the top part than in the lower part. But these things only last for some time. There was a similar feature in Gran Canaria, and ultimately it fell over. So another feature that um, people are very excited about is these uh, turquoise and pink rocks. Um, they occur near the caldera margin, and this is where hot 
fluids were passing through when the big caldera volcano was active. And uh, they looked like tiles, and this is why the local people call them los azulejos, uh, the tiles, the colored tiles. And uh, this is uh, very spectacular. It's almost, uh, yeah, lunar or Martian type landscape. And uh, they produce wonderful colors and they have been used in the past uh, for making pigments and uh, for kind of paints and things like that. And uh, of course, nowadays they're protected. You cannot really kind of take any samples there anymore. So here's more of this thing, and there's some more recent lava engulfing these older rocks, these uh, hydrothermally older rocks. And uh, this is something geologists like, because you have events superimposed on each other, and it gives you a sense of time. Another feature that is very popular is uh, this feature here. It's um, a type of weathering pattern that um, has puzzled geologists for many years. It's uh, when rocks actually start to get hydrated and they break off. It's a bit like onion skins. And um, here we can actually see how this forms on Tenerife because the process is not always completed. And we see there is, for example, in the top right, a little bit of an old rock core that is still not hydrated. And um, the out outer part is already hydrated. So. Here, people have speculated how this forms, and um, if you kind of have waters attacking a rock, infiltrating it bit by bit, then it flakes off like onion skins, and therefore it's known the phenomenon as onion skin weathering. So a, a very good locality for looking at this phenomenon uh, is up in the National Park on Tenerife, and uh, students of geology would definitely go there and have a look at that. Inside the caldera, there is also exposures of intrusive rock. That means magma that solidified underground. And here we have various sheet intrusions. They are arranged in different geometries, and they have different names depending on their geometries: cone sheets, ring dikes, and uh, it's beautifully exposed. So uh, students of geology would usually go there and look at them. And there are sometimes also vertical ones. So here you see uh, fractures that were filled with magma, and uh, they are partly eroded out, then the locals call them tabaruchas, and uh, you can look at the exact features in superb detail. There's some larger intrusive blocks like this one here, it's called the cathedral, and it sits also inside the caldera. So we must envisage that there was probably more material above into which this material has intruded, which is now eroded away. You see these beautiful columns that uh, geologists get quite excited about. And uh, the beauty here is that uh, you look at the columns in detail and there's a person there in the lower left, uh, sorry, in the lower right dressed in white, you see the magnificent scale of this. So you're really in awe when you're standing in front of this, it's rather overwhelming. And uh, this is something that these mega structures is something that geologists find usually very appealing. So, um, Tede, um, the centerpiece of Tede's National Park is uh, Tede, and it's, uh, uh, as I said, the highest mountain in Spain. So I'll talk a little bit about Tede now for the remaining part of the lecture. And um, here we have some impressions of Tede, and uh, you can actually hike up there. You can also go up there with a cable car. And uh, the cable car costs a little over 20 euros, and it's only running on uh, non-windy days, but uh, it's very popular. Um, several million of people go up there every year. For the very peak, you need a permission, but uh, to go up to the plateau before the very peak, um, you can actually go there. And now there's plans to build a restaurant up there. So you can actually have a, probably quite a delicious meal up there, watching the scenery at about 3,500 meters altitude. So I personally predict that after Corona, this will be very, very popular. Now, there's also some um, plant species and animal species that are unique um, in the national park. There is a large lizard, and um, it's taken the color of the rocks. And um, we have to, of course, be careful. But it's a UNESCO site, uh, the national park, and the main features is the geology there. But as I said, there are several visitors, uh, visitor areas. There is restaurants there. There's roads going through there, many hiking trails. So the concept is fundamentally different to that in uh, Lanzarote with the Timanfaya National Park. 
So here you um, get the idea of the cable car. The cable car takes you all the way up to about 3,500 meters and you see the cable car stations in the lower right hand side and that's also where a big restaurant is being planned now. And from there on you need permission if you want to go any higher you need to ask uh, the authorities in the capital for um, um, a permit and a few years ago I did that and I hiked all the way up to the uh, summit crater. It gets very thin air up there, so it's, it's tough walking then. And uh, the crater itself has uh, sulfur, and as I said earlier, it was quarried in the past. And uh, here, the crater still emits some fumaroles, but they're not very hot, so it's not very dangerous. It's more that the temperature up there is very low, therefore they are very visible. But um, uh, you would really kind of get earthquakes and things like that if the volcano was ever to erupt again. So, uh, and then you wouldn't get permission to go up there. So there's no real danger to the best of our knowledge. So here's a few more things. And you can just about see the monitoring equipment here. The volcano is heavily monitored. So if the volcano starts to wake up, we will know weeks in advance. And therefore tourists are allowed up there as long as things are quiet. Now, of course, you uh, will see some fumaroles there that this, these gas exhalation sites, you shouldn't necessarily touch them, but uh, you get beautiful sulfur crystals there on the right hand side. And uh, the sulfur is building up again since uh, mining has stopped. The sulfur crust is getting thicker. So it's beautiful to watch this from a volcano point of view. Close to the summit, there's a little cave and it's very interesting. You can go there as well. It's called the ice cave. And uh, back in the old days, prior to refrigeration, People were getting ice from up there and bringing it down to the coast very quickly and you could make ice cream and sorbet from it. Nowadays, of course, we don't do this anymore, but most of the time the temperature up there is below zero. So that means that dew and rain would actually kind of solidify as ice and snow. And uh, this has been one of the uh, sources of uh, ice cream for the rich people back in the days uh, prior to refrigeration. Now there's a little side cone next to Tede and it's believed to be a twin, but uh, recent research actually says it's a parasite cone, as some people like to call it. Tater grew so tall that nowadays the magma can't be bothered to go all the way to the top, so it comes out at the side. And Pico Viejo means actually the old cone, but in fact it's the younger cone because of this misinterpretation in the past. But uh, you can hike there and you can enjoy this as well. And uh, here's a view inside um, the crater there. And um, there's a hiking path going all the way from uh, the top of Tate down to this site and even further down. So lava types, this is something geologists find really um, exciting and there's some spectacular lava types on Tenerife. And uh, here there's uh, the Pahoy Hoy lava, it's a Hawaiian term, it means lava that has smooth surfaces. And there's quite some spectacular lava fields here on Tenerife for these. And um, there's the rather young lavas from Tater that have come down. You see the lava tongues here and they make little channels. It's beautiful to see from a volcanological point of view. And uh, you get various impressions. People go there to study this in detail, to enjoy this. You also get obsidian there. And obsidian was used by the Aboriginal people to make spearheads and arrowheads and tools of any kind. So here's a few impressions of uh, lava fields that are a little older and um, these are partly overgrown. It takes about a thousand years for lava to start to host vegetation. So these particular lavas here are about 20,000 years old. And here's some relatively young lavas. And this is intriguing because this lava flow stopped halfway on the hill. So uh, it's not like water. Lava behaves very differently to water in terms of its physical behavior. And this is a really famous site where you can see that lava stopped. Water wouldn't stop halfway on the hill, it always runs down. Lava can stop because it can actually freeze over while being on the hill. Other features that uh, Tenerife is famous for is hornitos, that's a Mexican term. This is uh, little cones that happen to form on lava flows. If you have a lava tunnel and a little hole in the top, then lava can spill out and make a little cone. 
and they're called hornitos. And uh, there you have some beautiful examples in the national park. Here's two in succession. Another spectacular feature in the national park is what's known as Tater's eggs. Um, that's how the locals call them. And that is round lumps of lava. And here they go from tens of centimeters all the way to tens of meters. And uh, people are very puzzled about how they form. And uh, there you have these isolated balls of black lava here, in this case on Montaña Blanca, the light colored hill. And uh, well, we know from Hawaii that they form when lava is actually traveling over a slope and there is bits that can detach and then they run over the active lava flow and like a snowball, they accumulate layers and then they roll down the slope. So if you cut them open, you'll actually see that they're made of layers that have accumulated. Another feature that um, uh, Taylor is famous for is the peripheral area of lighter colored material um, that has a different chemical composition. Lighter colored magma is usually less dense and um, it doesn't want to travel all the way to the peak of the volcano. So what happened is that much of it erupted on the periphery of the volcano and the colored units here around Tater are the ones that have uh, uh, a slightly more silica rich composition and they have formed in, the, in a sort of peripheral belt. And there's also Montaña Blanca in red where we've just been. And uh, so the taller the volcano gets, the more likely you will actually find that it will erupt through its flanks and no longer to its peak. And this is what happened at Tater. So many geologists believe that Tater will not grow any higher because of this. It's very unlikely that it will erupt from its peak, but if it erupts probably from its surrounding. And here we have some lava flows that you see have come from the periphery and people have mapped them in detail. So geologists love to do that. They love to predict how lavas flow. And uh, here you can see how far they reach down. Some of them have even reached the sea, but this all happened prior to the main settlement of the island. Here is uh, some of these domes, and this is Montaña Blanca again. And uh, in the right-hand image, you see the hiking path. Um, you can actually walk up there. There's very little restrictions. You see the crisscrossing of the path. So uh, you're not supposed to kind of walk too much off the trail, but uh, um, the uh, restrictions are very low in this case. And this makes Tate super attractive in the Tate National Park because people can freely roam there. So the last aspect is the historical eruptions. And uh, here I'd quickly like to run you through them. People can visit all the vents of historical eruptions. There is the 1704, 05, and 06 eruptions, then the 1798, and the last one from 1909. And I picked them out in red on the little map here. And I also used the little green map here on the right-hand side where they're picked out in black. So there was an eruption in 1704, 1705, and it had three vents at the same time or in quick succession. That's uh, Siete Fuentes, uh, Fasnia, and Arafo. Arafo happens a little bit off in the uh, Guima Valley, but the uh, Fasnia and Siete Fuentes uh, vents were up in the National Park, or what's today the National Park. And uh, yeah, I'll show you some impressions. So here in the center of the image, you see some darker rocks. That's the uh, vent in the Guima Valley, a little bit off what's today off the National Park. And um, here we have um, one of the vent sites in the National Park from the 1704-1705 eruption. You can walk there, you can look around there. You're not allowed to take any material, it's protected, but uh, you can go very close and you can really touch the volcanoes if you will. Here's another kind of, of the 1704 or five lavas and vents. And uh, you are allowed to, to really kind of go very, very close to it. And if you ask for permission, if you get written permission, you're also uh, allowed as a geologist to sample for scientific purposes. But this is of course controlled. So the 1909 eruption, um, this was actually witnessed. There's some photos here and this happened um, to the northwest of Tede on the rift zone as well. And here you have a pockmarked area that marks this. And uh, you can walk around there and uh, enjoy the area. 
The uh, 1492 eruption, that's the one that Columbus described, this was not directly visited or uh, um, um, uh, viewed. There was no kind of witnesses at the time that were on the island, but it was viewed from the boat. And uh, this is most likely where the eruption took place. In the far distance, you can see one of the other islands. So once you're high up in the national park, you get the sense of an island chain, and this makes it particularly attractive. The 1705 eruption, this was witnessed uh, by um, uh, local people and there's various sketches from that time showing how the eruption happened. It was on the flank of Pico Viejo and it emanated, um, it emitted quite a lot of lava and uh, here you see the vents and the lava flows coming off it. And uh, here's another impression just from these vents and uh, you can even go there, walk there and look into the vents. Here's one of the vents and there's a person for scale it's uh, on a human scale, it's, it's awe-inspiring, but uh, on a volcano scale, it's a tiny vent. There was uh, one eruption from the rift zone in 1706, which was causing some damage, unfortunately. Nowadays, it's a tourist site, it's very attractive, but uh, back in the day, it was a bit of a financial disaster, and that was the 1706 Galatico eruption. What happened there is that lava flew all the way down to the coast, and it filled the harbor basin of the main port that was uh, um, uh, trafficking ships uh, to and from the Americas at the time. And um, there's a painting from that time, an oil painting, and it shows the lava entering the harbor basin. The harbor basin was useless after that, and the main port was shifted to Santa Cruz. So um, there has to be a complete economic restructuring of the island at that time because of the volcanic eruption. But Calachico is one of the main uh, tourist attractions these days because you can actually see the lava uh, rock uh, that entered the harbor and it's a very attractive site near the coast, uh, but it wasn't useful as a, as a main shipping port anymore. Now, um, the good thing about um, the area there is that you can hike around there. There is very few restrictions. There's hiking trails to all of these eruptions. Here's just a few hiking maps that you can see. And uh, there you can really interact with these um, recent eruptions. You can read on their history. And uh, this is one of the secrets, I believe, of uh, Teide National Park success. And uh, here's just some impressions. There is the main road on the left-hand side that goes around the caldera. And here on the right-hand side, there's a hiking trail on the caldera wall. You can just about make out two people there, rather small. And uh, you can interact on any level. And uh, this, I think, is that's what really kind of explains the success. And here is um, a blog clipping, and uh, this is from 2017, so it predates Corona. But uh, it's uh, clear that uh, Teide National Park is the prime national park in Spain, and it's got record visitors, as opposed to, for example, the Timanfaya Park, which has declining visitors. So the freedom for people to move around and um, make their own schedule, I think that's a huge secret. While at the same time, you can, if you're kind of explaining it properly, make sure that many of these natural features are not suffering too dreadfully. So if you are interested in some further reading, I can um, advise you to kind of uh, look at um, uh, a geology book that my uh, uh, colleague Juan Carlos Caracedo and myself have published. Uh, only uh, three years ago, and it's got uh, many hiking trails and uh, visitors and geosites in there for all the Canary Islands. You can spend a month of um, geology touring in the islands there, and um, this is something that personally I enjoy. Many geologists enjoy it, so if you kind of develop the taste for it, maybe this is something. And um, I would say thank you now, and um, I will. Uh, close my lecturing part there. I will stop the recording in a second and uh, then we'll, can, uh, we'll have a short break, about five or so minutes, and then uh, we can have a little discussion session.